A professional counselor in the Dallas area is growing in popularity for his treatment methods. How do you talk to kids about tarot? And with social media and television, it's everywhere and it's unavoidable for kids. Rusty Lozano is the founder of the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy. He's also been nationally recognized for his work with brain mapping. He's created a gym to work out the mind. His office features an obstacle course. Rusty Lozano is a licensed professional counselor, helping children with headaches, with anxiety, ADHD, and more. Here's where Lozano comes in. He teaches kids how to think their pain away with something called biofeedback. A North Texas therapist is treating patients in this unconventional way. We have Rusty Lozano who's joining us today. He's a licensed professional counselor. He put together an unusual treatment for teenagers who are struggling with mental issues, except He's taking this now a step further. Rusty Lozano, a leading uh, therapist and uh, pediatric biofeedback therapist based in Texas at the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy. And uh, Rusty, thanks for being with us tonight. Rusty Lozano, a father of four and also a professional counselor in Texas, says it's all about being a credible resource to your children. The Therapy Hour with Rusty Lozano. Your dedicated resource for mental health news, views, and tips you can use. Brought to you by the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy in Addison, Texas. And now, here's Rusty. Hello and welcome to the Therapy Hour. I'm Rusty Lozano, your host. And we are recording live, broadcasting from the studios at the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy in Addison, Texas. There are over 74 million children in the U.S. That's a lot of mouths to feed. So busy households, working parents, how do we know what types of food we can put into our children's systems and stay comfortable enough to sleep at night and not worry about health conditions? Well, here to talk to us about this, Marcy Sirota, author of the book, Hungry for Solutions. Tell me a little bit about the premise of this book and what led you to write it. Um, okay, so I'm a registered dietitian, um, and when my son was three years old, he was diagnosed with a benign brain tumor, uh, which caused a very severe form of obesity called hypothalamic obesity, where um, their metabolism becomes very, very slow. They gain a huge amount of weight in a very short period of time. They always feel hungry. They never feel full. Um, and, uh, you know, if you read about this condition in the medical literature, it says it's not responsive to diet and exercise. So most physicians that treat this condition will just flat out tell you there's really nothing you can do to help these kids lose weight. And just to give you an example of how aggressive it is, um, my son weighed, I would say 33 pounds when he was three, right before he was diagnosed with this tumor. By the time he was nine years old, he weighed 183 pounds. Wow. Um, And that's with having a mother as a registered dietitian. Incredible. Yeah. So it's something about the way the tumor works with the brain that that doesn't allow the brain to know when it's had enough food. Correct. It's it's on the part of the brain, the hypothalamus, which controls, you know, your hunger satiety signals, you know, travel from your gut to your brain. um, And it also controls your metabolism. So your child gained a tremendous amount of weight in a very short amount of time. What were you thinking? Did you know at this point that that was what was happening? Or? Yeah, we knew pretty quickly uh, that that's what was happening. You know, we knew that there was going to be, we, we had the tumor removed and we knew there would be at least, you know, best case scenario, a 30% chance that he was going to develop this condition. Um, but he had a brain tumor and it needed to be treated. So, out. okay. Yeah. And it, but it still inundated the system. It still damaged the hypothalamus. So, you know, when they peel it away from the hypothalamus, it damages mm, it. I see. And so now uh, what you're doing is you're having to manage his diet and, and his food intake through, through diet, specialized diet. Mm-hmm. They were going to be talking about four particular uh, chapters in the, in the book that you wrote. The first segment is on keeping your child healthy without negatively impacting their body image. The second segment is can making certain unhealthy foods off limits contribute to eating disorders. The third segment, can sugary junk food contribute to disordered eating by making one feel that they can't stop eating? And the fourth one is can sugar be addictive? Uh, I say yes. (laughs) I I think that you're going to, we have a consensus, you and I. Uh, Do you think children and adults sometimes use it as a drug to manage feelings? Uh, How does sugar affect the biochemistry of the brain? Let's get into the first segment. 
keeping your child healthy without negatively impacting their body image. Let's talk about that. Well, yeah. I mean, this is a line that I struggle to walk constantly. Um, You know, my son is actually now at a much healthier weight, um, which is why I ended up writing the book, because I did figure out how to get him to lose weight and to live a much healthier lifestyle. But due to this condition, he's probably always going to be overweight. And But I always sort of struggle to stress to him the importance of you know, trying to eat healthy, trying not to gain weight. But I also don't want to make him feel like being heavy is a negative thing. Because mm. the truth is you can be overweight and be healthy. Sure. Um, and you know, kids and adults come in all shapes and sizes, except size diversity in oneself and in others. And I think that's an important message too. But so if you do have a child that is starting to have health consequences from being overweight, you know, they're developing diabetes or heart disease, or they have high blood pressure. How do you sort of monitor their weight and and watch their intake, but without making them feel bad about it? And, and this goes back to you thinking about in grade school, being fun of kids. I mean, and, and like making fun of their weight, uh, calling them fatty or fatso. And we can inadvertently trigger that kind of self-esteem element with our children by saying something to them mm-hmm. about what they're eating and like how, how they look. What you're saying is that there are ways that you can do it without have, making them feel uh, uncomfortable or bad about themselves. And sometimes kids just really can't help it. If you have uh, a seven foot two, not that I've ever seen somebody that tall, but you know, six foot five, you know, seven, the kids come in larger sizes these days. Mm-hmm. And a mom who's also about six foot two, and then the child just naturally has larger characteristics. But that's not necessarily an unhealthy thing. Right. It could be just uh, a genetic Absolutely. component. But then what you're saying is there is a line that's drawn when you start seeing a lot of these health issues uh, develop, like, you know, early onset of diabetes. Absolutely. You know, I saw this baby one time. Uh, we were at the store, and I mean, it was. He he must have been, I say baby, he was a small child. Maybe he was about four or five. And he was like ginormous. He was a really big child. And you can tell he was overweight. Uh, He looked at, he had the little rolls on his arms and on his neck. And, um, but that's not necessarily, that's not necessarily like his fault, right? I mean, it could be something else, but, but, but the, the thought that came to my head, which is what I'm sure goes through other parents' head is like, how could they let this child get to that point? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, used to feel that way all the time, walking around with my son that, you know, I was being judged because I would see people looking at him um, and looking at me. And you just really learn to develop some perspective. um, Mm. And unless you walk in somebody else's shoes, you don't know what they're going through. You never know what anybody's going through. So you have to try really hard not to make assumptions. I mean, I, in, in to further that, I, I remember there was a situation where there was a child also screaming. You could tell he's, he was definitely had some sort of learning disability and maybe on the spectrum. Screaming really, really loud in a Sam's warehouse. And I remember there was a dad that walked by and says, you should be ashamed of yourself. Talking to the parents as if it was a behavioral issue. Oh, I've um, had people say things to me before about my son's weight. Is that right? Mm-hmm. How did that make you feel like when they... I mean, did you have something that you, a way that you explained that or? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, kept my calm. I was, you know, shaking Mm -hmm. and enraged inside and I kept my calm and I just said, look, he has a medical issue from a brain tumor that's caused him to be overweight and he'll probably always be overweight. And you shouldn't judge somebody until you've walked many moons in their moccasins. And, you know, he still kept arguing with me that you know, I needed to do something about it. And I finally said, I'm a registered dietitian. I am doing everything I can. And he had a brain tumor. <laughs> what, yeah. what do you yeah, want I mean, what from else me? can you do? And then I finally left and I went home and I saw my husband and I just burst into tears. I mean, yeah. it was just so upsetting because he'll never know how hard we work every single day at staying healthy. You know, my son has to work 50 times harder than anybody else, unless it's somebody with his condition. Right, right. Um, just to be overweight and not, you know, morbidly obese. And so, um, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about is sort of raising awareness about not only this condition, but just about, you never know. I mean, you talk about seeing that kid screaming. I remember 
being in a daycare group where I saw this child screaming and I remember thinking, God, what's wrong with this child? Or, you know, why is the mom not able to handle it? And it turned out the child had a brain tumor and he was screaming because of the pressure in his head. But you just never know. You never know what people are going through. Um, And I'm also very passionate about, like I said, accepting size diversity um, and understanding that we come in all shapes and sizes. And I love to educate people that, you know, humans are born with one of three body types. So, you know, there's the the sort of tall, lean, skinny people that can eat anything they want and they never seem to gain weight. Um, We call these ectomorphs. And, you know, uh, for example, famous ectomorphs might be, you know, Toby Maguire, I think that's his name, Spider-Man, yeah, yeah. Uh, real long and lean, or, you know, Kieran Knightley. Um, that person is going to have a very hard time putting on weight. Then you have your mesomorphs, where you're, you're very muscular people like Madonna or maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger, and they're always going to be very muscular and they put on much more muscle, whereas an ectomorph would never be able to develop the mm-hmm. kind of muscle a mesomorph would have. Um, and then there's the endomorphs that just genetically are going to be rounder and smoother. They're going to have more fat mass and less muscle mass, and they're always going to have a hard time keeping weight off. And, you know, some people are combinations of the two, but this is genetic. And I think it's important for people to understand that you can't change your body type. I mean, yes, you can be the healthiest endomorph you can possibly be, but an endomorph is never going to look like Kira Knightley, you know, in in a size two, if you're a female. You know, it's just not possible. And so I think that, you know, just due to, you know, these images we're bombarded with from Hollywood and from magazines about, you know, the way that we're supposed to look. And that's not reality. That's not the way that humans are meant to look. So I remember in, in undergrad in psychology, we read this book. Uh, it was called The Beauty Myth. I mean, it was written by a feminist, but that's okay. I mean, because we had to, you know, we had to visit, visit all types, right? But it really did spend a lot of time talking about how bot we put emphasize so much on body image and how when you look at pictures like on a Vogue magazine or you know a fashion magazine that there's no possible way that you could ever ever really compete. No, no. Now back then this is in 2000, but back then I mean I, I think that there was still a Photoshop, but it was very hush hush. It was very it just belonged to the industry. Mm-hmm. And then as you learned and and this particular uh, software became more prevalent you realize how you can manipulate things you can manipulate people's skin to look flawless right you can lengthen out their leg you can tuck in the tummy um so when you see somebody and, and this is one of the reasons i also found out that a lot of hollywood stars don't like their picture taken mm-hmm. like by the paparazzi mm-hmm. and they're always walking around with sunglasses because they have this certain image that right. they have they have to and, maintain it yes and they'll prove even for them <laughs> right yes even for themselves they can't compete with themselves uh, so they have to 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 keep themselves kind of closed off and and concealed and only approve certain photos that actually go out because it, they're doctored and like they look great and it's it's really refreshing that you bring something like this up because this this honestly is the first time that I've ever really heard about like the the different types of body images uh, and and I think it's super important because now I can it gives me a way to kind of categorize and classify you know the, the individual. I think it's very helpful. It's very helpful in in you know for children to understand and grown ups so that they can accept their body type. You know, and when I was growing up, I remember you know in the seventies and early eighties watching Charlie's Angels and. Wonder Woman, oh gosh, uh, Farrah yeah. Fawcett, Jane Fonda, the Jane Fonda workout, and yep. you know, always gr- and and then playing with Barbie dolls, which yep. you know <laughs> yeah. are very um, unrealistic body types. But um, and thinking, okay, this is what women are supposed to look like, and this is what I'm supposed to look like when right. I grow up. And you know, I did sort of flirt with disordered eating a little bit growing up because. Once I started to grow and go through puberty, my body didn't look like that. It didn't look like Charlie's Angels and, and 
Farrah Fawcett because, and it wasn't that, you know, I do happen to be one of those sort of ectomorph, more skinny tight bodies, Uh but I'm very short waisted, bigger hips. And so I'm never going to have this like tiny five, eight minimum to be a a runway model. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, I always thought, well, if I just eat less, I can look like that. But that was never something that I was going to be able to achieve because my body type genetically is just not like that. Interesting. That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Um, and I think women were the first ones to to experience that type of pressure because a Barbie and, and you know, all these images of, of Wonder Woman on television, she's beautiful, uh, even stayed beautiful and you know, beautiful now. But, they, but men never really experienced this. I think in my own action figures, my mom, uh, she... She never throws anything away. So it's, her house is like a living museum. But she happened to find my brother's old uh, Star Wars action figures. Mm-hmm. So Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, Han Solo, and all these people have like just, you know, you look at their body shape and they're just like skinny dude. Mm-hmm. You know, not they don't have real big muscles. I mean, it's just right. an arm is an arm. Right. But those same characters now, you go and like you look at them and they're completely built out muscular they all look like the hulk absolutely all of them yeah and so now it's like it's the same thing is now starting to happen with men and uh and and it leads psychologically there's the uh uh there's the the diagnosis of what's called body dysmorphic disorder Mm -hmm. and that's where in their mind they see something that's that's not regular like they see themselves too fat or too skinny and and they may not even represent that at all so they have to keep altering themselves the people that actually pursue it and now they even have like living Barbie dolls, people that have removed ribs and mm-hmm. and have gotten like, you know, the, the enlarged lips and mm-hmm. like the hips to try to look like Barbie. Absolutely. And it doesn't look right. But in their mind, like it's something psychologically. So this starts very early on. And I think that going to the to back to like the uh, the, the initial topic that we discussed in protecting your child's self esteem, it's really important that you keep a healthy keep a healthy perspective on your child's body image and help them to feel accepted regardless of what's what body shape they are um and that's one of the things that you really emphasize and really good information we'll be right back we're going to take a quick break we're visiting with marcy sirota on her book hungry for solutions we're right back on the therapy hour Listening to the Therapy Hour with Rusty Lozano, brought to you by the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy in Addison, Texas. Hi, we're back. If you're just joining us. We're visiting with Marcy Sirota, author of the book Hungry for Solutions, and uh, it's hungryforsolutions.com. You can also find her book at barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. Hunger for Solutions. So, Marcy, we just spoke about keeping your child healthy without negatively impacting their body image. Our next segment is going to be centered around can making certain unhealthy foods off limits contribute to eating disorders. Let's get into that. Does that mean Halloween candy, (laughs) pizza, all that good stuff like ice cream? No, no. Not at all? Not at all. Okay. Well, one of the things you said, um, so... With my son's condition, you know, the way that I was finally able to successfully get him to a much more healthy weight was by cutting out, um, I would say, 90% of processed and man-made foods. So when I say processed foods, you know, as you mentioned, it's something that can sit on your shelf for a month without going bad. Um, Anything in a box that's made in a factory Um, usually flour or sugar or one of the first three ingredients. Um, And then, you know, another man-made food would be bread and pasta because if you think about it, I mean, they didn't grow on trees, they didn't grow out of the ground, and they didn't come from an animal. So it is something that man made. Now, my son has, you know, a a very extreme condition. So that's not necessarily necessary for Mm. somebody who doesn't have this condition. But I do feel really strongly that – Processed man-made foods are driving the obesity epidemic in this country. Um, And for my son, I do have to make a lot of these foods off limits. But then I always, you know, there are other healthcare professionals that would argue, well, no, it's not good to do that. Because when you categorize a food as good or bad or, you know, off limits, 
that that sort of drives a disordered eating type mentality yeah. um, and can just if somebody is on the verge of developing an eating disorder, that that type of limiting them from um, excluding some foods is not going to help them. I remember when um, when Fruit Roll-Ups came out, they came out when I was in fifth grade and the commercials you bought into them, boy, I mean, they look fun. Uh, and I was like, okay, hey, I need to try. And I kept asking my dad, <clears throat> I really want this fruit roll-up. Get, get, did you get the fruit roll-ups yet, dad? I'd call him at work. And uh, finally he brought them, he brought them home and I tried it. And it would, and the fun about it was that you would get to unroll it, unravel this little square, you know, and it was like this, I mean, it was like the stickiest stuff. I mean, they, and they had it, I mean, they showed a really cool way to eat it. It made a little zip noise when you tore off a piece. And I wanted to make that zip. It didn't make the zip noise. I wanted to make the zip noise, and then you put it in your mouth, and then it was just goo. Um, and it really didn't taste like fruit, even though they boasted about like it, it tasting, having all these incredible flavors. I didn't really like it much. And I think that was really my first experience with something that was like heavily processed. Uh, and, and, you know, they, I'm sure that they do have like some fruits in there and some fruit something but very different if you ever had that experience your kids ever like been drawn to something like that before oh. and like you've been just like horrified Oh, all the time i mean you know certain uh children's cartoon stations for example are very heavy on commercials yeah. for kids that have all of these i call them uber processed yeah. fake foods like the fruit <laughs> gushers that turn your head oh, into a strawberry absolutely the fruit <laughs> and like gushers. skittles and yeah, you know, candy with food coloring and oh, it's got like a waxy type of mm. texture. It doesn't resemble real food. Sugar cereals. Um, and I am horrified. You know, a lot of times there are celebrities and sports professionals mm -hmm. that are endorsing these foods. So not only are they making the fun, the food look, you know, fun with the music and the color and the um, animation that they uh -huh. put with it, but then they've got this really cool celebrity oh, man. that's, that's, you know, like, drinking soda. Right. And, and, and so they make it cool and, and they do, and they talk about it at school because I remember I wasn't one of the, I didn't have one of the cool lunches <laughs> that some of these other kids had. I had like a, a potted meat sandwich it was nasty, you know, uh, but, but then they would actually drink these juice boxes and I had something like Kool-Aid, I don't know, milk or some kind of, some kind of punch. And so the kids do, they talk and they notice things like this, um, because they see each other eating it. What is that? Or they see a commercial and it's enticing. So we're up against like a incredible system that's uh, multi billion dollar when it comes to foods and, how do we continue to fend them off? I mean, it's uh, it, it's it's hard work, you know. I, did you ever listen to Eddie Murphy Raw when they were talking about the the homemade? Well, <laughs> it's the homemade. I remember uh, the commercials for it, but no, I never yeah, watched it. it. It's it's the homemade uh, egg McMuffin, uh -huh. like you know, and and the child's like, oh, I'll get you an egg McMuffin, and so the mom would go in and make one and like have egg like running down their arm, and they're sitting there dancing like saying, I have an egg McMuffin. <laughs> He's just made it home. Uh, but it wasn't the Egg McMuffin. So there, we're up against a tremendous amount of pressure from this industry. And so then they come home and they really want these things. And so we're having to say, no, that's off limits. Or maybe you can have a little bit, but not too much. Mm -hmm. And then what's wrong with you? You just want to make my life miserable. It, has it ever turned back around on you like it's your fault? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. You know, I read this really interesting book called Consuming Kids. Um, and I remember something in the book about how the food industry have something they call the nag factor when they make certain foods. Um, and it may be with toys also. I don't remember. But it's like, OK, I remember going to Target one day and we were going to Target to buy a Lego set. So we went into the, you know, straight past everything into the toy aisle and my son's looking at Legos and I noticed, and I took a picture of it, that at my son's eye level were, was a shelf of these huge vats of mini Oreo cookies, okay, Ooh. in the toy aisle. And so, of course, he starts saying, oh, mommy, I want those, I want those. No, sweetie, you can't have that. We're here to get Legos. But why can't I have it? And it turns into this whole tantrum where they're jumping up and down and they're begging and they're, and then, you know, the whole fun of the experience of going in for this Lego set 
mm-hmm. has suddenly just evaporated. It's lost its luster, yeah. <laughs> right. And now we're fighting over the Oreos. Mm. Um, and the, the food industries, they know that. Um, it's, it's like some grocery stores will go to or even um, restaurants that are very geared towards healthy eating yeah. will go to the cash register and there will be a cookie the size of my face. And it's gooey and it's chocolatey and it looks mm-hmm. amazing. And, of course, the kids want it. And I'm a dietitian. I look at this cookie and I see six cookies because I am at an age, first of all, where I remember what a cookie is supposed to look like. Right. Now everything, it's called portion distortion. You know, the portions served in this country are huge. Yes. When I was growing up, a cookie was, you know, maybe a third of my palm. Um, and like now, a Nilla wafer? That might, yeah, like a Nilla, well, maybe <laughs> right. a little bit A little bigger, small, a little, little bit bigger. bigger. Mm. But yeah, but now, you know, we have a whole generation of kids who look at that cookie that's the size of my face and they see one cookie. Then if I agree to let them have the cookie, Interesting. then we start fighting about the fact that the cook, they can only have half the cookie. They have to split the cookie. And it's still, half the cookie is huge. It, it, it's it's three cookies, but we're still fighting about it. And they think that I'm so unfair and I'm the worst mom ever. And it's just – it's so, so difficult. Um, and, and so then you, not only are you dealing with that, the industry and like how it looks so great, but then you have a child that can't tell the difference, that, that doesn't have that filter to say stop. and Right. And then now they're getting upset. Right. and. Um, and well, why? And then you have to continue to explain yourself. Mm-hmm. I mean, that must get really tiring. But it's not just my son with that condition. My other son, too. I mean, he's mm-hmm. having just as big of a fit about mm-hmm. it. It's just that the, the stakes are higher. The consequences are right. more with my son that has, uh, the, I'll call it HO, hypothalamic mm-hmm. obesity. Um, but yeah, and so it's kind of like, okay, well, I don't. I don't want to make foods off limits and I want to be able to say, yes, we can have treats once a week, but we still have to negotiate over portion sizes constantly. So, for example, you know, we have a once a week dessert. We don't keep any desserts in the house. We go to the, you know, we'll go to the ice cream store and there's a small, a medium and a large cup. Okay. So I tell them that they can have a small cup and then I look at the small cup and it's huge. (laughs) And I'm yeah. like, do you have any kid size cups? And they're like, oh, yeah. And they go under the shelf, <laughs> hidden, and they pull out the child size cups, which wow. are pretty appropriate yeah. for me, for mm-hmm. an adult. Um, and I say, okay, you can have one scoop. Interesting. And we're still fighting about it. So um, it's really, really difficult. And I think that, um, you know, back to where we had originally started with these sort of uber processed man-made foods that don't resemble food anymore i don't put ice cream in that category necessarily right it depends i mean if it's chocolate chip ice cream with nuts um or chocolate ice cream with nuts that's less processed yes it has a lot of sugar um and it's definitely a treat and it's not the most healthy thing in the world but i would much prefer my children to eat something like that than to go eat something that looks waxy with food coloring right. and just right. doesn't even look like it resembles food at all. So do you find yourself having to explain to your children, like always giving exp- explanations as to like why not you can't mm-hmm. as a way of safeguarding their self-esteem yeah, I mean, instead I- of being no, that thing will make you, that thing will make you weigh 50 pounds. No, and- I don't. I try. I don't use those words. I mm-hmm. just try to say, you know what? That is not food that humans are meant to be eating. Don't yeah. be tricked. And I try to frame it like that. Yeah, don't let them. the food industry trick you because this food is, it's not going to make you feel full. It's going to want to make you eat more food. It's going to put a bunch of stuff in your body that is going to make you act in a way that you're going to get in trouble. This is just not the kind of food when you when you're a grown up if you choose to eat this food, that's your choice. Yeah. But right now, I'm your parent and we're not buying this food. Wow, I love it. So you turn it back around on the food industry. It's do. their fault. That don't be tricked. I do. It's them and and this is really what's So that's fantastic. So it's not so much that you're having to take the blunt of the explanation and, and like well, explain well, no, because you just can't. But you're actually turning it back around and saying, "Look, this is why you can't, mm-hmm. and it's them. This is not real, and I love it. I mean, that's that's a great way to kind of yeah, you mean, know take that pressure off of yourself and the kids consistently asking over and over again. I appreciate that. We're going to take a quick break. We're visiting with Marcy Sirota regarding her book, Hungry for Solutions. 
on HungryForSolutions.com, Barnes and Nobles, and Amazon.com. Be right back. Therapy Hour with Rusty Lozano. Brought to you by the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy in Addison, Texas. Hi, welcome back to the show. If you're just joining us, we're visiting with Marcy Sirota, author of the book, Hungry for Solutions. Hungryforsolutions.com. You can find her book on barnesandnoble.com, amazon.com, and of course, hungryforsolutions.com. And we're moving into our third segment, which is... Can sugary junk food contribute to disordered eating by making one feel that they are they can't stop eating it? I was going to say before I I stop myself. My my dad has this salsa recipe that's really hot, and it will actually make you sweat beads like off your head, like your head, your forehead, your entire head to be sweating. But you can't stop eating it because it tastes so good. I mean, it's the flavor and it's the way all of the mixture of uh, you know tomato and like the oregano and, and cilantro, all of that has a play and it has this, has a real savory flavor, but then it's hot <laughs> and you kind of forget that part, but it doesn't matter because like you want more. Tell me about that. Tell me about this idea of how sugar, sugary junk food can contribute to that kind of, that kind of mentality. Well, you know, sugary food or sugar in general um, activates the pleasure centers of the brain. So, um, you know, they've actually done, I think, PET scans on people after they do cocaine or heroin and they see, you know, what lights up in their brain, the pleasure centers of the brain. Mm. And then they give people sugar and they do the PET scans and they see the same pleasure centers are lighting up. There's many different forms of sugar. There's sugar that comes in fruit that's naturally packaged sugar. Um, which is very different from table sugar, which comes from sugar cane. Yeah. Um, and then there's honey and there's maple syrup, which are more naturally packaged. But um, And then there's the sort of more uber processed, artificially created sugars, such as uh, high fructose corn syrup, which are even sweeter than sugar cane table sugar. Um, and so I think that, you know, we've all had that experience where we've eaten, you know, like a brownie fudge sundae with, you know, hot fudge on it. And you take a bite and you're just like, oh, my God. And, yeah. You know, your eyes roll back. I mean, that's that's what's happening is it makes you feel really good. And so you want to have that feeling again. So you mm. want to keep eating. Um, and, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with sugar in moderation for most people. Um, but again, we live in a country where they are putting the, they being the food industry yeah. is putting sugar in everything we eat. They are putting it in our deli meats. They are putting it in frozen French fries. They are putting it, you know, when you go to a restaurant, they're putting it in pretty much every recipe. Yeah. Um, and it's just, um, another term that they use in the food industry is called a bliss point. And so when they're sort of testing out these foods, the goal is to get people when they eat them to reach their bliss point so that they want to keep eating it and they want to keep buying it. And so that sounds kind of it's a little calculated, uh, isn't it? Sounds a little yeah, absolutely. Manipulative needs completely, manipulative and completely. And wow. So um you know, there are a lot of healthcare professionals that might say, like, okay, well, you shouldn't make kids feel bad about eating sugar. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm just, you know, it's fine, like I said, to, you know, once a week, go have a appropriate size dessert, have some dark chocolate chips a couple times a week. No big deal. If you want to put a little sugar in your coffee, I mean, put sugar in some of my recipes. I mean, it's mm. not an evil, terrible thing to do. But when you're used to having high amounts of sugar all the time, you just keep craving it. I don't know if you've ever withheld sugar from a child that's used to eating it several times a day um they go crazy really they go berserk um i I mean just tantruming and whining and it's really really interesting um so i think that there is a potential 
to sort of, um, and, you know, we'll get into this in the next segment, but for children to use food to manage feelings because, you know, they feel bad, sugar makes them feel good. And that's something that they have access to that's in their pantry that they can get anytime that they want. And I think that as a society, we will often say, oh, you know, you poor things, yeah. you got a boo-boo, you know, here's, here's a, a lollipop. Right, right. right. That, that type of thing. Or, you know, they even portray when – when somebody is going through heartbreak, that they sit there with the spoon and yes. the entire jug of ice yes. cream, and they're like sobbing, like mm-hmm. while they're eating ice cream. Absolutely, because sugar, Maybe. sugar has always been given us, given to us to kind of make us feel better as a treat. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, yeah, it just seems to me like I mean, I remember, like I said, being a teenager and being in college, and get these big cookie cakes. Mm. for birthdays and you know they kind of have the frosting on it and they're real thick and gooey and we just kind of keep them in our apartments and I just I couldn't stop eating them like I kept being drawn to it over and over and eating this cookie till I was like I feel sick like I feel disgusting this is awful and um, I remember calling my dad and saying dad I feel I feel really sick and he said well what did you eat and I told him, he's like, oh, well, that's that's the college crap diet. <laughs> that's yeah. why you feel sick. <laughs> You're eating a bunch of junk. Um, but I, I do think that people that are struggling with disordered eating, I think a lot of them find that when they take sugar out of their diets, um, they stop craving it. And then they find it easier to stick to appropriate portion sizes. And they find it – food doesn't seem to be calling to them from the pantry in the same way. Mm. Um, so I think it can be a very useful tool, um, for some people that are using food to manage feelings and that are just, um, tend to just keep craving more sugar to take it out. And so what is the difference between like that kind of sugar that you would find in cookies and ice cream and the sugars that you would find in fruit? Okay. So, um, They're different sort of on a molecular level. So Uh sugar that you find in cookies is is sucrose. It's from sugar cane. Sometimes people will use honey or maple syrup, but those are similar. And then you have fructose, which is – comes in fruit. And they're metabolized a little bit differently in your body. So in terms of fructose tends to be turned into triglycerides and fat, whereas sugar tends to be turned into – sugar in your body, yeah, a different right. type of sugar, doesn't really glucose. Break down, right. um, but the sugar in fruit, when you're eating it in fruit, meaning you're not turning it into juice and you're not making it into high fructose corn syrup, it's naturally packaged with fiber. And so it is digested more slowly. It takes your body longer to break it down. So your system isn't flooded with sugar so quickly. So it tends to keep your blood sugar a lot more stable, whereas when you eat sucrose table sugar, you know, your blood sugar goes up really high and then you crash. So it's just a difference in the way they're metabolized. And eating too much fructose can be a problem, Um, but most people don't. And what I find that when people are used to eating a lot of table sugar, sucrose, their taste buds get very dulled to where natural sugar doesn't taste as good. So fruit is not as satisfying. It's not satisfying that sugar craving for them. Whereas if they take the, sh- the sucrose, the table sugar out of their diet for, you know, 10 days, fruit t- starts to taste really sweet again. Yes. Um, so it's just different. So, you know, interesting on that point, um, I'm giving up sodas for Lent and I'm not doing a very good job. <laughs> try, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It really is. You know, uh, and it's hard just craving sugar like that. I went to go turning my rent check at the beginning of the month and now and i know uh shannon she's the the front desk lady and they had a bowl of candy there and while i was talking to her this is after i i made the commitment to give up sugar like blatant sugar and sodas for lent and i just reached over and just grabbed an, a sucker and just started eating it and i didn't even think of, it wasn't until i actually got into the elevator and leaving that i realized that i just like totally broke something it's such an automatic thing mm-hmm it's crazy how that happens. Yeah. But I know in the past and I've given up sugary sodas and the paste like, and, and I started drinking them again. It tastes like you're drinking maple syrup. It's like so thick and like, you know, I don't know, it's just a different sensation mm-hmm. when you have it out of your system. Mm-hmm. But then when you're drinking it for a while, you don't taste all of that anymore. Right. I mean, it's really insane how that, how your brain kind of turns that into to something different. Mm-hmm. 
but it's hard to kick. It really is. I mean, it, you psychologically, I was, I was telling a friend the other day, I can taste Coca-Cola in my mouth. I know what it tastes like. Mm-hmm. Like I know when I'm craving one and I know what I'm looking for and I can already like taste it in my yeah, mouth. Even the thought of it. Like, what is that? Even the thought of it is like, <laughs> like oh, how, how did they so do that? I mean, how, how really, how does that happen? Uh, and, and we just walk blindly into it. And like you said, I mean, it's in everything that we eat. I avoid a lot of Asian foods now, except for, for pho, which is like amazing. <laughs> it's really good. But I can't eat any kind of any takeout Chinese food because most, I call it sugar food. Like all the food that, that has like this sugary aftertaste and, mm-hmm. and it just like kind of, it grosses me out. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just not something I'm used well, to. Well, and you ever notice how after you eat that food, you don't feel very full? Like you might yeah. for a minute, but then like. 20 minutes later, you're starving. You're starving for more. That's from all the sugar. Because you're craving that well, and, that, that sugary yeah, stuff, and I mean, also, even though you're full. Absolutely. But also what it's doing is it's triggering your body to produce insulin, which then drives sugar into your cells. So it's left your bloodstream now, and now you start to feel hungry again. Wow. I mean, it's it's really a sticky mess. Yeah. Somebody can't stop eating it. Like, what do you say? Like, how do you handle this with your with your kids? You know, I just make them very aware that, look, you you, ca- you can't eat candy every day. You can't eat sugar every day. Um, it's fine a couple times a week. So we, we have what we call uh, Wednesday's a special treat day. And on special treat day, you know, they get a couple dark chocolate Hershey's Kisses or, you know, a small handful of dark chocolate chips because those, the dark chocolate is much lower in sugar. Um, but it's still satisfying and it still mm. has enough sugar to be sweet. Um, or, you know, I mean, if worse comes to worse, you know, and we're sitting at the allergy clinic waiting for an allergy shot and they have those little pops, uh, not popsicles, the dum dum yeah, lollipops. Dum dum lollipops. You know, whatever. They can have some small piece of candy if they happen to be at school and for whatever reason, don't even get me started, candy was handed out. Right. <laughs> then fine. That's your special treat for the week. Um, and then we have a dessert once a week, uh, once a week, but, um, hard for me to control what they're doing when they're at someone else's house. Um, and when they're not with me, but when they're in the house, they know that Wednesdays and the weekends are when we have sweets. And personally, I've known this of you that, that when there is something like that available, that you set limits, which is a really important thing. So it's not that you're saying, no, you can't ever have it. No, no, no. And then starting an issue, it's like you can have one or some or a limited portion, which is really clever uh, because you're not you're not trying to stop the entire mechanism. You're just controlling it. Right. I mean, and I'm not going to be able to stop the entire mechanism. Mm-hmm. It's too strong and it's too ubiquitous. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like fighting an uphill battle. Um, but the most I can hope for is to teach them about appropriate portion sizes and that everything that's going to be served to you in this country is going to be two to three to four times what your body needs. Just, you know, I always say the size of the palm of your hand. Try to keep it to the size of the palm of your hand if possible. Fantastic. So that's that's actually you're educating your children and not so much just uh, letting, letting society do it for them or, or letting them choose for themselves. But that voice will – it will signal in their head. Yeah. and. It, and, and you're molding them. Right. I mean, you're parenting your child when it comes to food. Right. And Clever. at least that way they'll know. And they may choose to eat more than that, and that's fine. But at least they're not doing it because they don't know any better. It was Absolutely. a choice. Great choice. We're visiting with Marcy Sorrento. We're going to take a quick break. We're talking about her book, Hungry for Solutions. You can find this book on HungryForSolutions.com. You can find it on BarnesandNoble.com and Amazon.com. We'll be right back after these messages. to the Therapy Hour with Rusty Lozano. Brought to you by the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy in Addison, Texas. Hi, welcome back. If you're just joining us, we are visiting with Marcy Sirota, author of the book, Hungry for Solutions. You can find her information about her book on hungryforsolutions.com. You can find her book on barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. 
Our last segment today is on this topic, can sugar be addictive? And we've covered a lot of this already, but we're going to see where we go with this as we add these other components. Do you think children and adults sometimes use it as a drug to manage feelings? Uh, How does sugar affect the biochemistry of the brain? So let's get into this. Marcy, can sugar be addictive? Let's start with the, do you think children and adults sometimes use it as a drug to manage feelings? I say yes. (laughs) I say it does. Absolutely. Uh, And I made the example or talked about like the breakup and like eating the tub of ice cream with the spoon. Remember when uh, the, uh, the owner of Jurassic Park did the same thing? Uh, at the end of the at the when his when his park was all in shambles and and they were all eating ice cream he goes spared no expense and and they were talking about this is good and they're all sitting around eating these big tubs of ice cream because it was melting right but yeah can can it actually be something that we use to calm like to soothe us I say absolutely I mean first of all if you know gambling can be an addiction which is not a substance that you're mm-hmm. putting in your body why can't sugar or food in general, for that matter, in general, be an addiction. For sure. Um, you know, I was really it, – it's funny. If you had asked me this question, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago, I would have been like, absolutely not. Um, but that would have been speaking from a very limited perspective um, because at that time, you know, I just hadn't had as much exposure. I was really, really lucky when I was living in Philadelphia uh, to – have a dietitian mentor who specialized in food addiction. Mm. Um, And, you know, I had never heard of food addiction. And she just sort of introduced me to this whole world of people that were using food to manage their feelings. And what she did is she put them in a 12-step program. So they were in, you know, Overeaters Anonymous. And then at the same time, she was taking all the sugar out of their diet and all the flour out of their diet. Because if you think about it, those are the foods that are the hardest to stop eating. Mm. I mean, you know, think about it. Like, is it really hard to, and it may be for some people, but, you know, let's say you have a bowl of quinoa in front of you. Mm -hmm. Is that hard to stop? I mean, do most people binge on quinoa or, you know, corn? I think it's easier to stop. There are always going to be people that are going to have a hard time stopping on any food. But I think that if you put a bowl of pasta in front of them or a bowl of some sugary food, it's much harder to stop eating. So Because it tastes really good. And you know, those flavors, the creaminess and mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it really is. It's it's really interesting how food plays with the palate. Absolutely. And, you know, she as part of training me. She had me read this book called Anatomy of a Food Addiction. Um, And it was written by, I believe, a psychologist who struggled with food addiction. And at the beginning of the book, she did this amazing job of explaining how uh, different foods work on your brain. So you're eating a lot of sugar, that's increasing serotonin production, or you know, mm-hmm. I'm not exactly sure the specifics, the uptake, something. Um, and you know, when you're eating high fat foods, that is triggering endorphins in your brain. So that it literally on a biochemical level is affecting the way that your brain is working and affecting the way that you're feeling after you eat these foods. So after working with a lot of clients and just hearing their stories, I mean, she would have me sit next to her while she would do her counseling. And she had me do that for a good three months before I was allowed to do any counseling on my own Mm -hmm. uh, with clients with food addiction. But um, hearing their stories and hearing about people that when they would get upset would go into the pantry and eat an entire loaf of, you know, Mrs. Baird's white sliced bread. Um, you can see how they are managing their feelings with food. And they learn to do this at a really early age because you think that we all, a lot of grownups have unhealthy coping mechanisms and, sure. and reach for all kinds of different ways to manage their feelings that are not necessarily healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that sugar and, and food can be one of those ways. And I think that that's something that children have access to. Um, and it's just easy to do. So you want to hear something really interesting. Um, you know, mash, you think of like liquor made out in the boondocks. Mm-hmm. What, what do they call that? It's, uh, 
like it, it usually has an X on the jar and uh yeah. and it's um what is the what I'm is that type of liquor? I know exactly what yeah. you're talking about. It's like mash but you know it's uh it's actually uh, moon moonshine. 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 <laughs> moonshine. <laughs> okay. Moonshine. Okay, get this. So I was I know somebody who I met somebody who made moonshine and I was just asking about it, you know, and they even had they they got me onto this um uh it was a YouTube video about this guy, moonshiner named Pop Popcorn Sutton. And uh you know how they make moonshine? Yeah, it's rotted sugar. There yep. you go. And that's what I learned in learning about food addiction. There you go. Is that sugar or alcohol is the ultimate sugar because right. it's just fermented rotted sugar. So what if like the same addictive qualities that affect an alcoholic drinking liquor, right? Hard liquor and mm-hmm. beer, mm-hmm. fermentation of beer is one of the underlying foundations sugar. And like it's it's blanketed and it's completely it's completely camouflaged because you, you don't see it. I mean they sell it in bags. Like ginormous bags at the store, refined, right, powder. No obvious, you know, you're not like having a hard time walking a straight line right, or acting. Right. I mean, maybe some kids get a little hyper when they eat yeah. sugar, but you know, it's not as obvious how it's affecting you Interesting. as it would be with alcohol. That's super eye opening. You know, uh, my mom is, we're, we're, we're Peruvian. So my mom has this house in Peru and she has this huge, it's like a clay pot, but it's used to make. A beer called chicha, which mm-hmm. is the type of beer that the um, that the Incans used to drink. I mean, so there are a bunch of herbs and uh, greenery, and, and I don't remember like what what they're all called. But the principal foundation of that is water, brown sugar, and cinnamon, mm-hmm. and then it ferments. So you put it in this big giant, and you leave it outside, and it ferments, and you leave it for two weeks, and it turns into beer. Yeah, it's called chicha. Yeah. And so, but it was a ton of sugar. I was like, man, this is a lot of sugar. Are you sure it's it's like molasses? Right. But it's the same thing when you're making any type of alcohol. You're taking a grain. Mm-hmm. You're to whether it's barley or corn or um, agave, and you're letting it ferment until, I mean, all grains break down into sugar. They're all wow. sugar. They're just packaged in a healthier way. Nature packages grains and fruits you know, with fiber and with um, a little bit of fat um, as far as the grains go to sort of slow how fast that hits your blood system. Interesting. But when you're fermenting it down to its most sort of elemental form is sugar. Wow. You know, that I just had an aha moment just with that idea right there. Totally. That moonshine is just fermented sugar and it makes alcohol and liquor. And so here we are dealing with sugar in all other forms, like in the form of cookies, Mm -hmm. in the form of brownies and... Wow. Yeah. That's pretty powerful stuff then. Absolutely. Absolutely. What would be the antithesis of that? Salt? <laughs> is salt the opposite? So should we increase our salt intake? Is that like the remedy? Not, um, I think we're dealing with a whole other issue there, right? <laughs> no, I think that, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that this exactly answers your question, but, you know, we got into this whole thing sort of in the 90s with, oh, fat causes heart disease. and Fat is so bad. And if you eat fat, it's going to make you gain weight. And that's not true. Um, this is this is a misconception. So I think and, you know, the food industry, of course, rushed to the rescue and created all of these fat free, high sugar foods, because what they do is they take the fat out and they put sugar in oh. to make up the taste. Hmm. So anytime you see something that's fat free. Even if it has a label on it that says, you know, heart healthy, which they're allowed to do because there's very little fat in it, it is really, really unhealthy and it leaves you feeling very unsatisfied and hungry. Fat is a satisfying food. It keeps food in our stomach longer. Um, It sort of blunts our insulin response. So um, I think that including more fat in our diet, less sugar and less processed foods is the answer. So I have a friend who's a, a big keto diet fanatic, and he said that I should put butter in my coffee. What do you think about that? Is well, that is that going end? another dr- direction? Well, to what end? You're going to give me your, like high blood pressure, dude. I shouldn't well, really listen to that. Well, here's the deal. I mean, in the context of eating a very you know low carbohydrate diet, which is what the ketogenic diet is, and you're not eating any sugar at all. It's fine to do that because your body's going to use the butter as fuel. That's no big deal. 
But I wouldn't put butter in your coffee if you're eating a high carbohydrate, oh, high sugar yeah, diet. Kinda, that's not antithetic. Yeah, that's not going to help. Adding fuel to yes, the fire. Yes, yes, no, definitely not. So, in your book, do you have suggestions? You have recipe suggestions for families and like how to get started with all this. Absolutely it's sticky. Right? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to make that point. Um, is that you know, although I did write this book with the intention of helping other children that have hypothalamic obesity, this book can be used to help anyone that's struggling with pediatric obesity, adult obesity, um, or even anybody that's just looking to try to eat a little healthier. This book has something in it for everybody. So I do. I have recipes. I have snack ideas. Um, I have, you know, charts where I say like, okay, here's the man-made food. Instead of eating, you know, this food, here's the nature-made food that you can eat instead that is going to maybe satisfy that same craving, but, you know, is going to be much healthier. Um, You know, I explain how the body uses sugar, how the body uses fat, and try to, you know, break down this misconception that fat's unhealthy. Mm. Um, And, you know, try to teach people to sort of move away from, you know, don't go for the fat-free salad dressing. Don't go for the low-fat salad dressing. Go for the full-fat salad dressing. Because the lighter ones are higher in sugar. Yeah. So um, stop buying things that are in a box. And then I even give suggestions because as you pointed out at the beginning of our talk, working parents, tired parents, <laughs> which is all of us. Yes. You know, it's really hard to come home from either a full day of working or a full day of, you know, running around with your kids and try to make a meal. And so we do cut corners and we do end up eating, you know, more box processed foods. I have ideas in there of how to um, – you know, get a healthy meal on the table mm. um, in the context of, you know, working all day and being well, single parent and all that. We have this cooker at home. It's like a pressure cooker and you can put a, a timer in it. It makes food really quick. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there there are lots of ways that you can do this and it doesn't necessarily have to be like oh, you yeah. need a tremendous amount of time on your hands. Yeah, I mean, you can do, there are slow cookers. You throw yeah. a bunch of ingredients in the pot, you turn and it on low and you leave, leave and you for work 12 hours later and dinner's ready. Interesting. Yeah. Do you think that there would be a lot of pushback from the, from kids and trying to adapt it to a diet like this in their families? I would do. you expect it? Oh, you yeah. tell parents to expect it? Oh, yeah. You expect a lot of pushback and I would not try to do everything at once. Okay. I, I wouldn't just... Go into your pantry and throw away every, you know, processed food. Um, We've tried that, but I've eaten cookies on the way out. And like, you know, so wait, 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 let me grab just one more handful. Well, yeah, it's like, I mean, I would imagine when you're going into Lent, you know, you like. Mm, yeah, that's why they call it Fat up. Tuesday. Totally. Because you get all fattened up with there the stuff you that you're about to give up. There but, you go. You know, uh, um, absolutely. So um, so it's not, it's, you can expect, parents can expect that there's going to be some pushback. There's going to be pushback. And what you have to understand is a couple of things. One, you make one change at a time. Okay. okay. First, get rid of the sugar cereal. Switch to a hot breakfast. Um, eggs and turkey sausage or, you know, oatmeal with uh, fruit or, you know, you can do um, not low fat, not fat free, but regular yogurt with um, fruit in it and maybe a little bit of granola. Um, start cutting down on foods that are really sugary. Then after everybody's adjusted to that, then you go on to the next change. Get the pretzels out of the house. Get the, you know, these uber processed man-made foods. Get the, you know, anything with um, a made-up name. Yeah. Twists, chips, straws. Zap. <laughs> Zap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Start getting rid of those foods. and then But you have to bring in something new, you know. You can't just get rid of those foods. Start bringing in, you know, salted nuts, um, sunflower seeds, mm-hmm. fruits, uh, vegetables, you know, you can snack on vegetables and I don't care if you have to give them ranch dressing so that they eat the vegetables or if you have to cook them in butter or ghee with salt and Parmesan cheese. Yeah. That is infinitely better and healthier than them snacking on, you know, pretzels. Um, the other thing is you have to understand is as a parent, you cannot just say, okay, kids, you're not going to be eating these foods anymore. And then the parent continues to eat those foods. Oh, right. Oh, right. That, yeah. That's, that's not, not it's, it's not going to work. Oh, the shoot. Foods, there goes my plan. <laughs> the foods can't be in the house because if the foods are in the house, they're going to eat them. Right. They'll um, find them. I mean, oh, absolutely. And so, um, you know, it has to be something we are all doing this together as a family. 
And as a family, we can go out. And yes, if we go to the movies, we can share a tub of popcorn. No big deal. Um, And you may want to make it so, okay, we don't eat these foods in the house, but it's fine out of the house. So if your kids go to a birthday party and there's pretzels, maybe that's fine. As long as they're not in the house, you're making huge changes. Um, so baby steps. And it's practical. I mean, you, you know, you, you can still have some of these foods yeah. and you're not taking them away just within moderation. Absolutely. And what about the communication part? Because I know my wife, I came home and, and she made spaghetti. She's a great cook. Uh, but she actually, you know, didn't tell me that she made the noodles out of zucchini and squash. And I was like, okay, yeah, what's so different about, like, did you, communication I think is really important. And let them know that it's coming because I think that if you pull the rug out from underneath them. Oh, yeah. You're going to have strong tart responses from them. So, 100%. 100%. You do. You need to have conversations about this. You need to explain why it's important. And you need to let them know we're going to be doing this too. It's not just you, it's brother, it's sister, it's mom, it's dad. Hopefully, grandma and grandpa will be on board. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least when they come to our house. Um, and we're going to do this together. And, you know, we're going to take it a little bit at a time. And I want your feedback. How do you, you know, let me know how you feel about this. If I cook something and you think it's awful, you can tell me in a very nice way mm-hmm. when dinner's over. <laughs> yes, after <laughs> Not right when we sit down. Right. But, um, and, and we can talk about, okay, well, what can I do differently? What can we try that you might like better? What about holidays? What about Thanksgivings and Christmases that you've had, you know, family tradition recipes that have been passed down? Yeah. How does that fit into the equation? I don't make any big changes. I, I I try to, and this is more because of my son's condition, we try to limit the amount of carbohydrate choices there are. So for example, Thanksgiving, you have turkey, you have your green beans, you have your salad, you have your stuffing, you have your sweet potatoes with marshmallows, and then, you know, there's probably tons of more options. Well, I will just say, okay, we're not going to do stuffing and sweet potatoes with marshmallows. We're going to pick one. I try to make sure that the ladle, I, I try to make not make extra. I mean, a little yeah, extra because we want right. leftovers. But, yeah, sure. That's, that's the best but, time to have leftovers. Know, I try not to make too much. I try to make sure that the ladles at the Weight Watcher stores, you can buy ladles that are actually measured to a quarter cup, a half a cup, and a full cup. Um, so, and you can't tell, I mean, if you look real hard, you can see that it says it on there, right. but they just look like ladles. Huh. They're made out of stainless steel. So I use those. And so the things in that way, if, you know, they want to go back for seconds, well, I've used a quarter cup ladle in there. Yeah. So the serving sizes are less. The other thing I do is, um, we don't use dinner plates. We use salad plates as dinner plates. So we, the same amount of food. And you put it on a salad plate, and it looks like your plate's heaped with food. And then you take that same amount of Interesting. food, and you put it on a dinner plate, and the plate looks empty. Wow. So it's tricking your brain. So I love that. I do not use dinner plates in my house. We use salad plates for dinner. I use dessert plates for snacks. Yeah. It's just the way it is, and then that way the plate looks full. It looks full to the eye because that's a, that's, that's a fascinating – that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. And the dinner plates they make are bigger than the dinner plates yeah. they used to make before. So yeah. I'm just trying to compensate for, you know, what sort of happened over the year. And when I'm shopping for new dinner plates and new bowls, I find, I mean, especially for, you know, cereal bowls, cereal bowls are huge. Yeah. And everyone fills it up to the top and then they fill it to the, they're not even thinking about it. So I buy rice bowls. You can use ramekins, um, Sir Latab has these little bowls that you can use that are actually, and you can fill them up to the top. And my kids don't even notice the difference. They don't even say anything when wow. I switch them out. Yeah. They just know, they just want it filled to the top. And it's perfectly okay. <laughs> Green yeah. light. Go ahead. Yeah. Let's say it is a holiday. And, and you know, that's usually when people want to stop is when they feel a little bit fuller. Mm-hmm. And like, I mean, do you, do you not, not talk about that? Or you only just like limit portions and like how many times? I mean, my have house, seconds. We have to talk about it because we have this extreme condition sure. where my child doesn't feel full. Yeah. Um, if he didn't have that, I might do. Th- I would probably do things very differently because I grew up in a house where nobody said anything mm-hmm. about how much you were eating or what you were eating, um, and I always thought that was a nice way to do it because it, you know, erring on the side of not causing disordered eating or you know negative body image. Um, but you know, I just say that 
you, it's that's enough for now. It's enough. You for filled now. up your yeah. plate. If you want to have seconds, and it's a holiday, fine. But okay, that's, that's it. it. After seconds, we cut it off. Got it. Okay. So it really is just kind of limiting, uh, just just putting portion control in like the amount of times I can go back and refill. Absolutely. And I try to put a lot of non-starchy vegetables on the table, and a lot of protein. So you less carbs. <laughs> so protein is good. Protein is good. So you know, tur- I don't. It doesn't bother me as much if they want extra protein. They want more turkey. I don't care if they want more gravy. I don't care if they want more creamed spinach. Um, I just don't want them to keep going back for the sweet potatoes with the marshmallows and the bread and the stuffing. Those are the ones yeah. that are going to put weight on yeah, fast and that are harder stuff, to too. stuff. I know. <laughs> but you know, you got You have to compromise somewhere, and, and the education starts. It's, it's good to educate. It's yeah. Really good. Marcy, tell us of your website and where people can find more information about the book, Hungry for Solutions. We've been saying it throughout the show. But what else can they find on that website, Hungry um, for Solutions? So Hungry for Solutions is a website that I had originally started for parents of children with hypothalamic obesity. Um, I think parents of children that are struggling with extreme obesity would also find it really helpful. And, of course, you can order my book on there. Um, you can find out, you know, if – I'm available for speaking engagements, things like that. I also have another website, which is marcysarota.com, M-A-R-C-I-S-E-R-O-T-A.com, which is, I guess, more for anybody that's looking just to buy my book um, and they don't want to be inundated with a bunch of information about my personal story um, and about handling extreme obesity. They might find that website a little bit less overwhelming. Fantastic. And And to actually have you come and speak. And give presentations Absolutely. and educate people. Yes, I'm passionate about um, fighting pediatric obesity, about fighting the food industry, and um, even some of the public policy we have in this country that allows food companies to make food look healthy and put health claims on it when it is the antithesis of healthy. Interesting. Um, so I would love to speak to schools. Um, I'd love to speak to you know food banks, hospitals. Uh, Healthcare professionals and also podcasts. So podcast too. Well, thank you so much, Marcy, for joining us. You've been listening to the Therapy Hour with Rusty Lozano. Have a great afternoon.